I have so many favorite things about this book, if you can't tell. But one of the things I really love was how I would find myself kind of like grinning at the interaction interactions between characters, like both the spicy buildup between Violet and Zayden, but also just like the banter between the other recruits and and that moment where during presentation where you know, we lose that character. And it's mm-hmm. like, they were annoyed too, you know? Yeah. I thought that was that was hilarious. So talk to me about um, how do you write dialogue that's authentic to each character, especially when, as you said, you do have such a big cast. I do. I think, um, and especially because I kill so many people off. I'm sorry about that, by the way. Um, but you have to care about a character before you kill them. Otherwise, their death is pointless, right? It's just another character that's dead. So I have to imagine that all of these people are in a room and they are fully fleshed out, formed characters with fully fleshed backstories and motivations of their own. And that gets a little, like I said, unwieldy, like, cause there's, there's a lot of them in the room. And so I just, I know what tone of voice they use after the first couple chapters, I kind of get to know their personalities and their voices and what they would say in in those moments. And of course, in edits, sometimes you have to fight to keep like, no, 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 this is what this person says. This is how this has to go in there. And I love, they have this whole found family aspect and you have to have that levity in a book where you're, you're killing 20 year olds nonstop. If you don't have that levity, it just becomes this dark, disturbing, really violent book as where most of these 20 year olds, except for Violet, who doesn't want to be there are proud to be doing what they're doing and they're excited to be doing it. And Violet's like, you guys have all lost your minds. Yeah. So it's just mostly to me, just keeping them as individual people and making sure that if I read a line of dialogue, I should know who says it without reading the dialogue tag. And if I don't, then I have messed up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you, did you organize these characters in any way, like in terms of um, your, your workspace, like on your computer, was it just all in your head? So I have this giant fourth wing binder. <laughs> my husband, my husband made it for me and he bedazzled oh. it. Oh, that's so sweet. I love it. I know. And when you think my husband's like this giant six foot four, like Apache pilot man, right? So when he's like, I brought you a binder. Um, so I write down a sheet for each character. And then as I think about facts about them, I put them in the sheet and then I make sure they make it to the page. And then of course you have to like put that into um, like a, a a Google doc online so that your entire editing staff has access to it and everyone can see it. Otherwise your copy editor is like, you what, this is what, but I keep everything handwritten next to me so that as I think about something in the backstory of a character or their unique voice or something that just sets them apart, I write it all down. So they're all just, they're all just in there. Nice. That's very organized. And I have taken this thing that you do and we'll hopefully try to use it. You keep it in your head? I don't keep it in my head, but I am sort of, I have like so many places where I put things that I usually can't find them when I need them. Um, So then I'll have to, I waste a lot of time hunting for information. And I'm like always on the little search bar on my Mac being like, okay, this is a word I remember was in that document. So I do that too. Very professional. But I know, gosh, no, my problem is I like handwritten. So I'll grab an empty notebook Mm-hmm. And then I'll just start scribbling down notes as things come to me. And if I forget to take out that page and put it in the binder, I have like 14 notebooks around here and you will see me thumbing through each one just looking, looking for, for a page that I wrote something like a note or a quote or like something that a line that came to me. And my husband just walks in and he's like the only neurotypical one in our house. And so mm-hmm. he walks in and he's just like, and he has to back away because I've got just notebooks open around me and it's, yeah, I'm a hot mess. Trust yeah. It's it's organized chaos. Let's let us say um, <laughs> somewhere. It was a purple notebook, I think. Like <laughs> exactly. It's like it's sure. like the good thing is it's like you remember you wrote it down. The yeah. worst is when you don't write it down and then you know you had a great idea, but it's like frittered off into the void. <laughs> like if you're in the shower and it comes to you, and suddenly you're like, I have to write this down, or I wake up in the middle of the night and like write down a note, and then I wake up in the notes like hill. Yeah, <laughs> there's a hill. And a dragon. Yeah. And I'm like, well, no crap. There's a hill and a dragon. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. We're all geniuses at 3 a.m., right? I so. <laughs> um, Whether or not you're asleep. Yeah, exactly. So um, I read in interviews that um, this series is fully plotted for five books. So did. did anything in Iron Flame surprise you as you wrote? Or were you like, nope, I know what's happening? Oh, gosh. Okay. So I knew what was happening and I knew what had to happen because I had I had everything plotted out. In like little paragraph synopses, it's not like this is where this is going, how it's going to lead. And then I get into Iron Flame. And 
Um, I'm writing Iron Flame as Fourth Wing is starting to kind of snowball. I'm kind of noticing it. And it's like, um, it starts to feel like I'm sitting at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Mm. You know, like just that amount of pressure, just like squishing you into a million tiny pieces. And so I write the first 90,000 words of Iron Flame. And then my editor is like, does it have this or this or this? And I'm like, wait, it has this, but it's going here. And then I'm hearing all these things about, oh, I want this or this or this out of like coming out of book talk or something. And I basically, <laughs> I ripped the whole 90,000 words apart for two months, turned my book in. And my editor was like, I kind of wish it was here. Or this is all disjointed. I'm like, oh, I wrote it that way the first time. And she was like, okay. And I kind of thought this might lead to this, but it doesn't here. It's like, oh, it's written like that. And then the first time. And finally she's like, where's the original? manuscript yeah and I'm like oh all right and I forked it over and that is that's iron flame so I think what surprised me more weren't necessarily the plot twists because I knew exactly what was happening but I doubted myself so much in that initial drafting process to make it happen that I cost myself two months of ripping something apart just to turn in the original yeah I've been there that's it is it is um it is a strange feeling when you start to hear voices beyond your own as you write. Yeah. I've never dealt with it. I've never written. Um, I've always written interconnected standalones. And of course I've never had anything blow up like this. And I think the voices get in no matter if you try to block them out or not. And so I took the steps of like, I block my name on TikTok. I block the books hashtag because I love TikTok. I love like animal videos and stuff so yeah. I wouldn't see it that was the only it's like the only way to get through it I just never experienced it before and because the books come out so close together it was it was a lot I think it's the best I feel like I say that all the time people are like how's it going I'm like it's a lot <laughs> yeah yeah no but I that makes sense because it's all of a sudden you know you you write in a space of kind of quiet or you know, really what you're hearing is the characters, right? It might not be quiet, but like you're, you're with your characters. And then all of a sudden there's all these other voices and in opinions and expectations. I think, um, I think blocking your name and stuff, I, I actually also do that. Um, and, and, and I've done it for years. Like I've always blocked my Goodreads pages and for my books specifically and, um, and block my name on things. And it's, it's super helpful. So good job. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not the only one. Cause I felt horrible doing it, but I just, I, I wrote fourth wing in two and a half months because no one was in, no one was in my head. It, it was just me and a computer and the joy of getting to write fantasy. And then it was just, like you said, the, the other voices come in and suddenly you have all these cooks in the kitchen and you're like, I'm making soup. And they're like, right, but it needs bread. And they're like, but I'm making soup. <laughs> and then, you know, it yeah. just. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I also think readers deserve to have a safe space to talk about. Yeah. The book in the way that they want so that if they're like you know what Saba's book is garbage like they can do that and not worry that I'm like looking at it you know <laughs> like <laughs> I feel the same exact way and I feel like if um readers are entitled to their own spaces and usually that's Goodreads right so I stay off of Goodreads I always treat it like um like the Lion King where he's like it's a shadowy place Simba we don't yeah. go there yeah. right <laughs> um and then TikTok I noticed was becoming a lot like that and I was like okay well these are reader spaces that I shouldn't be in and if you invite me into it by tagging me even sometimes I'm like, oh, I still shouldn't be here. But for the most part, I'm so content to be like, have those spaces, say whatever you want and however you want to feel. And everyone should have their own safe, like safe spaces, I guess is the way to yeah. put it. Yeah, absolutely.